In this video, we'll describe the, some of the underlying mathematics of basic kernel density estimation, uh, including the definitions of a kernel and the bandwidth. These are two important features that show up in uh, kernel estimators. And uh, we'll make some recommendations about choices for each, because each one of these things poses uh, some choices in our model. So a kernel estimator can be understood as a simple weighted local moving average of the response. And to better understand that, let's uh, just consider a relatively simple model. Uh, a response is equal to some unknown function of a predictor x plus some noise. And we you know, typically make the assumption that our epsilon term is normally distributed zero mean and some constant variance for all for all i. So f is not specified uh, and it's to be estimated from the data. And in kernel estimation our estimator of f evaluated at any point x is the following. It's this f hat down here. So this looks somewhat complicated. Let's try to unpack it a bit and we'll try to notice that this is really just a um, a weighted average of the response and then we'll define uh, the individual terms in the weight in just a bit. So let me highlight this lambda term and this k. So this k is a function. It's a function of x minus xi over lambda and these highlighted terms are basically the weight. So if we define wi to be equal to 1 over lambda times this function k of x minus xi over lambda. We could think about this as the weight in a weighted average. So the top would be you know 1 over n times the sum of wi times yi where those wi's are the weights and then in the in the numer uh, sorry in the denominator you'll notice that we just have uh, the sum of the weights and the denominator is simply just to ensure that the weights uh, for each yi sum to one and that makes it a true weighted average right imagine if I calculated your grade but the weights that I used on homework assignments and exams and participation, etc. didn't sum to one, that would be problematic. Either I would be inflating your grade or um, you know, deflating your grade, whether they sum to, to greater than one or less than one. So now let's define the terms that make up this W, right? This lambda and this K are undefined at this point. Let's, let's become more clear about what they are. So k is a kernel, which means that it's a function that's positive. So k of x should be greater than 0 uh, for all x in the domain. And it should also be such that um, it's symmetric. So k of x is equal to k of negative x. For, so this should be true of all values of x. And the third condition that defines a kernel is that it integrates to 1. So it's, it must normalize. And that integral will be over uh, the whole support of k. So we'll see different examples of kernels. And in each case, uh, we'll see that the kernel is defined over a certain domain or support. And if we integrate over that domain, we should get 1. So it might be nice to notice that um, Two of these things, uh, non-negativity and uh, normalization, are defining features of PDFs. And so we can and we will use um, PDFs as kernels. For example, we'll, we'll look at the normal PDF as a kernel. So here are some commonly used kernels. And the uniform kernel is just the continuous uniform PDF on negative 1 to 1. So that's one possibility of a choice for a kernel. A second choice might be 
uh, just using the standard normal uh, PDF. And one thing to notice about this one is that in theory at least, this will weight every point when computing uh, our estimate of f. So, you know, the support of a normal distribution, the domain, is the whole real line. And in that case, it, this technically will not be a local weighted average and can be a bit less efficient because it is giving some weight, even though very, very small weight, to all points. Um, but the tails decay pretty quickly to zero and so it assigns very, very low weight to points far away from the x point that we're, uh, that, that's in question. So a third option for a kernel is the Epinechnikov kernel. And like the uniform kernel, it has bounds between negative 1 and 1, and so only weights points relatively close to x. And how close will depend on lambda. Uh, that shows up in the kernel estimator, and that will define in, in just a minute. Now this Epinechnikov uh, kernel can be shown to be optimal, uh, but with that said, the estimation procedure uh, in kernel estimation is typically not too sensitive to the choice of a kernel. So in some of the examples that we go through, I'll just use the normal kernel. It's somewhat convenient for uh, computation and the amount of efficiency that you, you lose with respect to the Epinechnikov is small, and so it won't matter all that much. So the fit is much more sensitive to the bandwidth, and that's this lambda uh, parameter. So remember, if we go back a few slides, uh, lambda showed up in this kernel, kernel estimator, and the, the fit is much more sensitive to lambda than the actual kernel. So lambda is called the bandwidth, and sometimes it's also called the window width or smoothing parameter. I may use smoothing parameter uh, as often as bandwidth. So the bandwidth controls the smoothness of the fitted curve. So some things to note about lambda. In general, smaller lambda values will give bumpier fits and larger lambda values will give smoother fits. And so I have a plot here that shows a few different values for lambda. Each one of these I fit using uh, a normal kernel. And so notice we have the, the black curve is lambda equal to 0.1. The gray curve is lambda is equal to 2 and the gold curve is lambda equal to 10. So notice that when lambda is equal to 0.1, relatively small, we have a very bumpy curve, right? Something that shoots up and down and is very sensitive uh, in its fit. The light gray curve seems much more smooth and it actually seems like a much more reasonable model. And then the gold curve probably seems a little bit too smooth. It's almost too too much like a line fit, which is what we're trying to avoid. So we're seeing that if lambda is too small, the estimator will be too rough. If it's too large, important features will be smoothed out. And, you know, this plot shows a normal kernel with three different smoothing parameters to try to get at the point that, you know, it's, it's very sensitive to choices in lambda. So this really begs the question as to how we're supposed to choose this bandwidth. And there are different recommendations. Um, some authors, like Faraway, uh, claim that rougher fits are less plausible, so this you know, black fit would be less plausible, since we would not expect the average response to vary so much as a function of, uh, of the predictor, so in this case of age. Um, on the other hand, over-smoothing fails to capture systematic variability. So we've got this trade-off and we need to try to balance between them. So Faraway uh, recommends choosing the least smooth fit that does not show any implausible fluctuations. So that seems a little bit ambiguous, possibly a bit subjective, and, and he admits as much in the, in the textbook. Uh, 
but that would give us a sense that the gray curve here would be best, right? The black curve is too, um, too rough. The gold curve is too smooth. It seems like the gray curve is, is right in the middle. So a few further notes on the bandwidth. Um, Faraway claims that knowledge about what the true relationship might look like can be readily employed. So if we have some knowledge about the true relationship, then we should use that. The problem that I see with this is that part of the argument for using non-parametric regression is that we don't know what the true relationship is. If we did, parametric regression would be more efficient. So I don't see this advice as being super helpful, but if you do have some sense of curvature, maybe just by exploring the data, uh, you can use that to try to guide what your lambda should be. Another note might be that if f hat will be used in making predictions of future values, uh, the choice of lambda is consequential. And Faraway goes on to defend the subjective approach to choosing lambda. And so he says, this is a quote, if the method of selecting the amount of smoothing seems disturbingly subjective, we should also understand that selecting a family of parametric models, for example, a standard normal regression model, for the same data would also involve a great deal of subjective choice, although this choice is often not explicitly recognized. So statistical modeling requires us to use our knowledge of what general forms of a relationship might be reasonable. It is not possible to determine um, these forms from data in an entirely objective manner. Whichever methodology you use, some subjective decisions will be necessary. So here Faraway is claiming that Parametric methods might seem objective, but they are subjective in the sense that we impose certain assumptions on the data, like normality, non-constant variance, etc. And some of those um, might be subjective. They might you know, depend on the modeler uh, who's working with the data. And the same is true, he's saying, of, of non-parametric regression and the choice of lambda. So all that to say, um, we should admit that there are some subjective decisions being made, but try to do our best in, in making those decisions so that they best capture trends in the data. So two final things to note. Uh, when you work with some simulations and data in R in the Unit 7 code, you can use the k-smooth function uh, that I have down here. So you can use that function to come up with some of these uh, smooths. And so they take in you know, x and y values. They will ask you for the type of kernel, which I typically use the normal kernel, but you could also use... Uh, the uniform box kernel or the Epinechnikov kernel. And then they also ask for uh, the bandwidth. And so in, in the exercise in the Unit 7 code, I will ask you to think about you know, different bandwidths and how they change the fit. So you'll get to play around with this a bit. So one final thing to mention, um, after our discussion of the subjectivity that is involved in choosing lambda. It's important to note that there are some automatic methods for selecting lambda. And uh, one of those would be a cross-validation method. And I may post a video uh, this week on that cross-validation method. So it allows you to, to attempt to automatically select lambda. But we should note that sometimes the cross-validation procedure doesn't give you uh, the lambda that, it, it doesn't give you a plausible lambda, right? It might give you something that just has much too bumpy a fit to, uh, you know, that then would be plausible. So keep in mind, you have to make some decisions in choosing, our, choosing the bandwidth. There are automatic procedures out there, but they can't be relied on wholesale.